not only you are our everything, but you're all that we need. And so, Father, I pray that you would meet us, Lord, in our day of trouble, in our tame day of joy. I pray, Father, that you would truly be displayed in and through our life as God. And as you are, Father, I pray that the world would come to know. So, Father, I pray that you would teach us and train us, that you would prepare us, Father, for the great work that you've set before us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Just turn and greet your neighbors. <laughs> well, greetings anyway. <laughs> Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 38. We've been looking at a series of trials that the king has been going through, King Hezekiah, and we've been drawing lessons of trials from them. And I was sharing with the teachers this morning before service, and we were talking about various afflictions. And why does God allow us to go through afflictions? Why does he allow us to go through trials? Well, I have a list of five things quickly, really, before we get into our study. As with all lists, they're not all inclusive. But first of all, this isn't heaven. This isn't heaven. We're not in heaven right now. We're not in our final destination. We're not to become very comfortable here. Matter of fact, we are to be seeking after the Lord, and we are to be doing His work of ministry, because our time here in this earth is so temporary. The world is seeking after heaven on earth, but we know that that's not going to happen. But one day we know, even though this earth is destroyed, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. Second, he allows trials to enter into our lives for the purpose of correction. Correction, yeah, just those times when we're not really heading in God's direction, when we're not doing the will of the Lord, that he allows these things to come so that we would not continue to live a life apart from the life that he would bless but we would live a life in obedience. Thirdly, to quicken character. God wants to mature us. He doesn't want to leave us as those baby Christians. He wants us to grow into something strong and something sturdy, somebody who can be used by him, somebody who can be looked up to him, as all will suffer some sort of persecution or just general garden variety trial. We look to those who are more mature us than us as an example of those who are endured trials before to see how God works and to see how God moves. Fourthly, he allows afflictions to enter into our lives simply to glorify himself. It's those intense times that we pray, that we seek after the Lord when it seems like all around us is closing in. And because of that, God is glorified. We cling to the one who is able to help us. And then lastly, I believe that it just simply confirms the reality that we so easily forget of spiritual warfare. We fight a spiritual battle, and it's a battle that rages daily. But there's one thing, and it's what Hezekiah is learning and what we see in our section of Scripture today. And, and I pray that we would see and recognize in our own lives and all of these occurrences of our afflictions and really everything that goes on in our lives God is previous to them. He was previous at creation. He was previous to our birth. He was previous at our salvation. And he's previous to our death and our resurrection. Best of all for us here tonight, he's previous to December 14th. I think today's the 13th. Previous to tomorrow. Get, see how that works? But he is. As I've said so many times before, right now, God is doing a work that we're going to be entering into tomorrow. We all have a general idea of what will be going on tomorrow. Some of us have it planned. Some of us, maybe we have no plans. We're just kind of flying into it. But regardless, God's previous to us entering in tomorrow. That means he exists in our tomorrow already. And because of that, we are able to possess tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after in faith in him as we are children of God through faith in Jesus, but look at it individual, as you are a child of God, then God is continually preparing your way and so that you're able to walk in boldness and confidence in tomorrow. And so, 
we deal with so many situations, so many areas of trials and various relationships and situations and circumstances. God's doing a work in all of them to do a work through them into our lives. And because of that, it may not be easy, it may even hurt a little bit, but I am to have a confidence. Now we know that our security occurs when God's previous practice meets man's present compliant response. When you're obedient to that which God has orchestrated for your life, it's then that you realize blessings. Now, James is realizing all of this when he wrote in James chapter 4, verse 13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city or spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. All of you who make such plans and the idea of plans apart from the, the will of, of the Lord, not so much that they're contrary to the will of God, but they just haven't invited the will of God into their decision-making practices. The majority of us, it's not that we're being disobedient, that we know God wants us to do something and we're not going to do it. It's just that when we make our decisions, when we make our plans, we haven't invited God into it. We can even do that here as a church. Let's do this presentation. Let's do this program. Let's do this event. And we'll develop these things, we'll plan these things, and then we'll give these things to God and say, we need you to bless this, as if he puts a stamp of approval upon it, rather than, what is the will of the Lord? What does God desire of us? Verse 14, still in James 5, I'm sorry, James 4, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Well, God is previous to our tomorrow. He's already there for, what is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. So, seeking the will of the Lord in our lives, in the various occurrences, in the planning of our life. So, personally speaking, what does it mean for God to be previous in our lives? It's to know and to have that confidence that he has gone before me in all of my uncertainties, in all of my fears, and in all of my doubts. All of these things, the unknowns of my life, these things get, that can render me ineffective or can even paralyze me in my Christian walk, again, God has prepared the things that I enter in. Some are going to be hard. Some are going to test you to your very core. We saw that with Hezekiah with Assyria at his very doorstep. He was tested to his very core. But nonetheless, God still delivered him. The Lord... Well, in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28, the Lord said, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Now, that's a very interesting statement concerning, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, and his soul is troubled. What is it that troubled the Lord's soul? What is it that troubled the Lord's soul? Was man's disobedience, Judah's refusal of him, but in this particular case, in that context, it's the cross. It's not so much the scourging and the dying, it's the receiving of the sins of the world for the first time, the Lord experiencing that. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, or, or keep me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So he's understanding, even though he has set aside certain attributes of his godliness, he is not omnipresent at the time, he does not, can't be everywhere at the same time while he was here on earth, he understood that the Father was previous to the cross. What shall I say, that we, we don't have the cross, that God's plan for salvation does not come to pass? No, he says, this is the purpose, I came to this hour. And so he knows that he's working out the Father's plan. And my, I guess you can whittle it all down. Jesus knows that he's in the will of the Father. And if you're in the will of God, you're in a good place. You're in a good place. You're in the place of blessing. And again, we can so orchestrate things around us and, 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 and go according to our own understanding and things that make sense and don't make sense to us according to the scriptures and whatnot, and, you know, such as wives submitting to their husbands unconditionally husbands loving their wives unconditionally and for some spouses it may not make a lot of sense but again it all boils down to this is the will of the lord 
And since it's the will of the Lord, this is what we do because this is what God is going to bless. For Hezekiah, the incident of chapter 38 is previous to chapters 36 and 37 for the purpose of preparation. Now, when I say all of those P words, what I'm saying is what we're reading about tonight in chapter 38 happened before the Assyrian invasion. It was, it's not being presented here in chronological order. So tonight I want to look at the trials of chapters 36 through 38 under basically two main categories for the purpose of marrying them to our lives. First, chapter 38, that's the trial that'll take your life. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. There's the trial that'll take your life. There is the trial that, well, I walked in that trial for quite a long time. That trial that would take my life is the trial of death. Secondly, there's chapters 36 through 37, the trials that will threaten your life. See, all through Hezekiah's trial with Assyria, that was the trial which would threaten his life, he had an assurance because of a promise from God. See, he was, according to Romans 8, 37, he was more than a conqueror and all of those things through him who loved him. And so, you see, and this is really not sticking dead serious or closely to the context, but what I see is Hezekiah's life is threatened here. My life was threatened in an unsafe state. I got right with the Lord. I say threatened. My, my, uh, my life was, well, it was the trial that could have taken my life if I didn't give my life to the Lord. But then everything else is a threat. Is a threat from the enemy? Is a threat in how I perceive trials? Because, again, I'm more than a conqueror in that my life is hidden with Christ. I'm more than a conqueror. I fight or I live from this standpoint of victory of the occurrences of my life. So the first thing that we see in Hezekiah's life here in chapter 38 is that death is at the door. This is a reality. It's is that from over here? That sounds like Linda's ringtone. <laughs> I see two eyes looking up over the chair. <laughs> Chapter 38, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. Every hardship, every other trial pales in comparison to the first one that you were experiencing and probably didn't know, but you were under the penalty of death. As you live this life apart from a relationship with Christ, you were experiencing the greatest trial that mankind can possibly experience. And God delivered you from that. God delivered. Even in your ignorance, God still delivered you. Scripturally speaking, when you see death, see sin, or maybe I should say the effects of sin, as Paul told us in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 13, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. We were on our deathbed. For some of us, it was a short period of time, for others, it was a longer period of time, but nonetheless, it was a detrimental period of time. So here we have Hezekiah on that bed, as we all used to be, and all unbelievers are, even today, at death's very door. As for the born-again believer today, even though our physical bodies are dying, spiritually, we are growing, thriving, and maturing. Now, I don't know where Hezekiah was in these first three verses with the Lord. I don't know what his relationship was with the Lord. I would imagine this is a trial for preparation, and maybe it was even a trial for salvation. We just aren't told. I mean, he seemed to be a man in verse 3 who was religiously right, but we know that that does not get you into heaven. And again, this was at least preparation because this happened previous to Assyria's invasion, previous to the previous two chapters. And so... God's got him exactly where he needs to be 
Hezekiah is keenly now aware of his condition. Do you remember if you were aware of your condition? I wasn't. I wasn't for a period of time, and that's the most dangerous place to be, thinking that you're doing well when in actuality death is at your very door. Well, that's how I lived the majority. I shouldn't say the majority of my life because I've gotten older and I've been saved almost as long as I've been was unsaved, but, but still you understand what I'm talking about. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so, yeah, I was at death's very doorstep. I was just as Hezekiah laying on that bed, but God. But God entered into the equation. For Hezekiah, God is going to enter into the equation. Now, it's not going to be just for Hezekiah's salvation, either just his life or spiritually. Again, we don't know where Hezekiah was with the Lord. But nonetheless, he entered into his life for Hezekiah, but also for God's purposes through Hezekiah because God is going to use him during this major trial that is going to be happening, that he's going to save the life of many. And again, you need to understand the magnitude of the work that God wants to use through you. God saved you, but maybe you were a previous part of the plan. Maybe God had this plan to save many, and you were step one. You were the first step in that plan. And is all you do, is all you need to do, is all that is necessary for you is to walk in obedience to the Lord, and God's going to do a great thing. Now, maybe you'll never even know and see that plan until you get to heaven, but I just need to walk in obedience with what God has given me, being a humble soul and a dedicated spirit, and God, well, it's up to him. Your will be done in our lives, Lord. So what did Hezekiah do? The same thing you did when faced with death. First in verse 2, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. He entered into a private place. See, when he's near death on his bed, he couldn't get up and walk away to a more private place. There he is. He's incapacitated, and he turns his face to the wall. That private place where, even though there was probably many people around him, but for him, it was just simply him and the Lord. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 5 to 1, or at least we're told, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadily set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face according to what the Father's plan was. Well, that's what Hezekiah is doing. Even by looking at the wall, he's setting his face before the Lord. Hezekiah faced the wall because there was no one else in that room who could help him at this point. He wasn't looking into the mirror because self could do nothing for him as well. Matter of fact, self is usually what gets us into such situations. If we look to all of humanity, there was none who could help us at all. But he had an understanding, and his understanding could have been based upon the word of God, even this scripture here in Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, speaking of our lives, in your book, they are all written, the days fashioned for me. All the days that God has fashioned for me, all the days that God, remember God's previous, God, God lives in our future, and he has fashioned these days. He has molded these days specifically for us that we are entering into. Is that a sneeze? Went away. Okay, it may come back. And so the psalmist, your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed in your book. They're all written the days before I was born, Lord, you existed in the days that you had prepared for me. You need to think that these are like verses that you need to meditate upon. Because whatever is going on in your life, and I know we all got things going on in our life, some are more intense than others, or times are more intense than others, but nonetheless, before I was even born, Lord, that you, all my days, 
they were written in your book, the days that you had fashioned for me. You had it all down, and it's all going according to your plan. Secondly, he then pleads in prayer. Then Hezekiah, verse 2, turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, verse 3, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He's sad. God has give, given us the sanctity of life, and he's just been told that he's going to die. And again, I might be taking a little liberty here, but I know if I stood before God, and if I told God, God, you need to remember this. Remember, O Lord, I pray, how, Lord, how I have walked before you in truth. And, Lord, how I have had a loyal heart before you. And, Lord, how I have done what is good in your sight. Can you stand before God and say that? I couldn't. I couldn't because I know what I'd be remembering in my mind. But I really believe maybe that's where the crying bitterly comes from. Because I really believe that it seems like arrogantly, or maybe this was just a holy man, but there's never been a man who has been perfect, Hezekiah is still making his appeal uh, based upon grace. Based upon grace. See, this is a heart that is, well, he wants it to be pure before the Lord. And I think if you start going through, and let's just even say, not in a way of bragging or boasting, but if you're just even reminding God of the good things that you've done or how good you have been, I imagine the reminder of every sin that you have ever committed will well up <clears throat> excuse me, before you. Because when you're in the presence of Almighty God, now he's in the presence of God through prayer, but nonetheless, when you're in the presence of God, you see the sinner who you are. But the good thing about it is, it is God who will judge the sincerity of the appeal of the sinner. It's God who will judge the sincerity of the appeal of the sinner. Because, you know, you'll look at people and you'll say, oh, this person's just going through and he's just giving the... or what? It's not for me to determine that. Yeah, he's saying the sinner's prayer just because he wants a handout from the church or he thinks if he just says this and goes on continuing to live his life that he's really saved when in actuality he's not. And we can go through all these things, but who am I to make that determination? It's God who not only knows the heart, but it's God who knows the intent of the heart. And that being the case, I just need to give all of that over to the Lord because the only way I came into this whole thing was through grace. Because that's the only way that we can make our appeal for, before a holy God is based upon the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, 10, Paul said, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. So Paul's got it right here. He's not saying I got grace because I labored. He's saying the more I labored, the more grace God gave me. The more I was obedient to the Lord, the more he gave me grace. The more I sought out his will and walked in his will, the more grace I got. And really, what, what, what would that really mean? I really mean, I really think it means because... The more I was obedient to the Lord and walked in his will and did the work of ministry, and the more I got involved in all of these things, the more I dug into the word of God, and well, the Holy Spirit even spoke to Paul as he penned the word of God, I saw the sinner that I was. And the more knowledgeable I became, the more knowledgeable I'm going to come, not only of sin, but of my sin. But what God does in the midst of all of that, I was going to say did, but he continues to do today, what God does in the midst of that, he continues to give us grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Because wherever sin wells up, grace always prevails. It always overcomes. And so here he understood the grace of God was with me. And when he says that, he means the grace of God is always with him. Secondly, we need to see the necessary element of repentance here. And he, you see this, I believe, through his tears as he weeps bitterly, understanding he's a sinner, understanding that more than likely, we'll, we'll see in a minute but, or a little while, but this is where everything has got me to on this deathbed. This is where it's all coming to an end. I know Assyria is coming upon the scene, and I know what they're doing to surrounding nations, and for just a moment is this, I thought the Lord would use me to deliver our nation and to fulfill his promises and 
and now my life's going to be taken of me, and now he's making his appeal before God, but again, he comes to the awareness of, uh, of sin, but then we see into chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 4, even though death is at the door, and this is important, God's not silent. God is there, and he's not silent. If you look throughout all the history of mankind, God has been there, and God has never been silent. We not only see that through the scriptures, and we see it through the Bible, we see it in the Gentiles, we see it in the, the, the history of all of mankind. God has always been there, and God has never been silent. Even through what is called the silent years of the Bible, from Malachi to Matthew, God wasn't silent during that period of time. We have the, Ma the, the Maccabees, I was going to say the Malachites. We have the Maccabees, and we have God still doing a work, God always doing a work in, in Israel and in man's lives. So God is not silent. Verse 4, And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will add to your days fifteen years. And I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign that you have from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. For us today, he will say, I'll turn the clock back. I don't know what a degree is back then. Let's say ten minutes. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it has gone down. So this is an actual, obvious work of God turning time back as God is God over all creation. So here God tells him of two great deliverances. First, he promised that he is going to give Hezekiah his life. Now that Hezekiah has seen the sinner that he is, and Hezekiah has prayed and he has repented, God promises that he is going to give him life. He's going to add to his life 15 years. That which will take his life has been dealt with. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Abundant life is the full life that we had at birth. It's the new life that we have at salvation and it's the amazing life that we have for eternity in the presence of God true, abundant life. And he tells Hezekiah that he will also maintain his life against that which threatens his life. Well, we've read about that which will threaten his life in the previous two chapters. That would be Assyria. Again, in verse 6, I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And really what that reminds me of is that as long as we are in the will of God, and God has a plan for your life, you're immortal. You're immortal. You're, I mean, we, we don't test God. Jesus pointed that out in the temptation and whatnot. But as long as God's got reason and purpose for my life, I'm immortal. There's nothing that is going to be able to take my life. There's going to be plenty that is going to stand before me, but God is going to enable me, because again, we're more than conquerors in all of these things, and so I'll be able to push through, and so I've got that boldness about me. And then when God's done with me, what does he do? He takes me unto himself. It's what they call a win-win situation. I'm able to prevail here on earth, and then I'm able to praise in heaven. And what more could you possibly want? Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us. Now God already said that he had him numbered. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to value the moments that the Lord has given us. I look at the times when I just wasted a whole day or wasted a whole night. How many times have we done that? Yeah, there's no doubt we need to rest. There's nothing wrong with resting. There's nothing wrong with entertaining yourself. Where is entertainment? Now, there's some bad forms of entertainment out there, but where does entertainment come from? It's come from God. So there's nothing wrong with all that, and that's not necessarily wasting time. But you know the time that you wasted. You know that you were wasting time when you, in fact, wasted time. And here we're told that I need to value the numbers of our day. Lord, teach me to number my days. That, Lord, every moment that you have given me for your reasons and your purposes, I will see your will fulfilled in my life. Now, again, 
take time to rest. There's no doubt about that. We were going to a friend's Christmas party on Saturday afternoon. The grandkids came up from 29 Palms. I didn't really have anything to do in the morning all the way through to about noon. So I just kind of hung out. I just laid on the couch with the grandkids and just enjoyed them. And kind of little guilt there and wasting time because I can think of everything I have to do. But I look at that, and we got to take those times too. And we got to learn to value those times as well. I mean, what good are grandchildren if you don't value them? What good are the moments of rest if you don't value that? And so, Lord, teach us to balance all of these things out that we may glorify your holy name in all that we do. Verse 7, And this is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundi uh, sundial of Ahaz. Now, the sundial of Ahaz... I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something that Ahaz put in the temple, or at least the area of the temple, and it had pagan roots to it. And so what we see here is God is God over all of these things. Ahaz was Hezekiah's father, and he was a very ungodly man. He says he's going to bring it 10 degrees backward. I don't know what a degree on a sundial is. Is it an hour? Is it a minute? I just don't know. I didn't look it up. didn't think to. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. Notice here, all of God's resources of creation are at his disposal for his will in your life. You have the full power of God. God is sovereign. He's sovereign over your life, but you can't just let it stop there. As God is sovereign over my life, and I am to subject myself to his will, but this is also the same God who is sovereign over all. He's sovereign over all of mankind. He's sovereign all of, over all of creation. And again, that's just an amazing thing. Even in the spiritual realm, with the spiritual battle that raises, God is sovereign. And so if God is telling me to do something, commanded me to go somewhere, as long as I'm in God's perfect will, he's able to orchestrate the whole situation. Nothing takes him by surprise. Remember, it was in the movies. Maybe it's been about 10 years now. I don't remember, but I think it was called The Tip of the Spear, the Jim Elliott story. Jim Elliott went down to South America and evangelized some of the native people there and was killed by them. I don't know why. I don't know why it happened. It, he really believed he was in the Lord's will, and I think he was in the Lord's will. But God was sovereign, and God in his sovereignty allows some of these hard things and difficult days to happen and these things to occur. And I don't know why. I don't know why, and I'll never, I never will know why. But I do know that God is good, and you know that God loves me, and I do know of God's sovereignty over all of these things, and that needs to be enough. Revelation 21.5, He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. It's true and faithful, the sovereignty of God. For us all... He went backward and forgave so that we can move forward and serve. That's what I see in this time clock thing. He went backward and forgave so that we can move forward and serve. All of my sins and lawless deeds, all of that past, he has chosen to remember no more. And there's one other reason why he did it, and I don't know why it stuck at the end of the chapter. I kind of think was Isaiah, either he wrote this or he had a scribe write it, and it was like, oh yeah, I forgot, and so he kind of stuck it at the end of the chapter here. And it says, and Hezekiah had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Well, that was the sign that he had given him, the sundial sign. So when the time of the trial came, verses 36 through 37, Assyria's invasion, Hezekiah should have known that he would be delivered. And I think he did know that he would be delivered. And I can tell you here, God's going to deliver you from all of your trials. And you can skip out of here holding hands, singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. But then wait till the trial hits. And then it's like, oh, there's a trial again. It's going to tear the, the heart right out of your chest. And so in Isaiah chapter 37, we saw it last week in verse 14, it says, and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. So he already knows that the Lord's going to deliver, but there's Assyria. Lord, now, when you said you were going to deliver me from the Assyrians, I had it all planned out different than you're allowing it to happen. I, I didn't think that you would allow them to come into the country. 
Lord, I didn't think that you would allow the Assyrians to siege Jerusalem. Lord, I didn't think you would allow the Assyrians to come up and make these boastful threats against you. But what does he do? He takes that letter, that letter of threats that the king's uh, representatives have brought to him, and he says, Lord, this is, this is your problem. Lord, this is something that you need to take care of. Because he's looking at all of these threats, and he understands that they're able, apart from God, they're able to do all of these things. And there's not a thing that he's going to be able to do about it. So what does he do? He does that which we need to learn to do. He just simply lays it all out before the Lord. So when you come skipping out of here, and then the trial hits, lay it out before the Lord. Because it's he who's going to bring the victory. It's he who's going to bring the deliverance. Hezekiah's response to all of this, verse 9, really verses 9 through 20, we first see a description of his condition, and then verses 15 through 20, we see his reaction to God's reaction or God's deliverance. Verse 9, this is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. This is a sort of a psalm, if you will, of Hezekiah. Verse 10, I said in the prime of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see Yah, I shall not see God, the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall observe man no more amongst the inhabitants of the world. My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night, you make an end of me. I have considered until morning like a lion, so he breaks all of my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me like a crane or a swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes failed from looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me to my surety. So this was real in his life, and we see how his heart was vexed during this time. Verse 15, <clears throat> What shall I say? He has both spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all of my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit, so you will restore me and make me live. So there's a turning point here based upon what God has said that he's going to do through the prophet Isaiah. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul. For you have cast all of my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot, Sheol would be, it's not hell as far as punishment. What we think of Sheol is the abode or the dwelling place of those who die. So when he speaks of Sheol, that was the place that he would have went to because he died. So Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Based upon what God has done, he's saying, we're going to praise him now. And don't you experience that when you're delivered from your trial? In, in the past trials that you have gone through, is there anybody who's never been through a trial here? <laughs> we need to check your pulse. Uh, <clears throat> in the trial that he has delivered you from, you just, you just want to praise him. You just want to sing these things to the Lord, sing praises to the Lord, because I've seen God move in, in my life. And it's just an amazing thing when you come to that understanding that God is mindful of you. In conclusion, verse 21, Now Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and apply it as a uh, poultice on the boil, and he shall recover. Just kind of a Christian concept here for our day. Was there medicinal properties to the figs, or were they just simply a symbol of faith? Well, the fact of the matter is, if he applies the figs, he's going to heal. If he doesn't, he's not going to heal. This is a, definitely a point of faith. There's no doubt about it. Why? Because God has told him to do it, so he needs to do it. There was a blind man, John chapter 9. Jesus approached him, and he promised him a healing. And Jesus mixed some saliva with some dust, and he put it on his eyes. Was that necessary? 
Well, if he doesn't allow Jesus to do that, I bet you he doesn't get healed. Now, he wasn't healed right away. Jesus did that, and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I was there, and I was actually able to do a teaching at the pool of Siloam. It was kind of a neat thing. It's probably about 1,000 yards from Jerusalem. Not from Jerusalem, it's in Jerusalem, but from the middle of the temple area, more than likely where they were at. So for a blind man, this would be quite a journey. He could ask where it's at, but my point is, this is going to take some effort on his part. But what does he do? He has faith in what the Lord has told him to do. And he goes, and he washes in the pool of Siloam, and he's healed. Now what happens if he doesn't do that? What happens if he stops the Lord from putting that paste on his eyes? Or what happens if he, you know, that's a long way. If he walks halfway, it's a long way. I don't feel like going all the way down there. And really, what difference is it going to make? Maybe he's even washed in that pool before. It's never brought my eyesight back before. But he, what is he doing? He's, he, he's reacting in faith in the word of God. And now, because now he's going for a completely different purpose because Jesus sent him, and that's good enough. He goes, he washes, and he's delivered from his blindness. I know that it is God who heals me. I also know that when I take my medication, or whatever it might be, I get better. If I don't take it, I don't get better. I know that God heals, and I know that God heals through a multi multitude of ways. I know that God gives doctors wisdom, I know that he has given man medication. And so I have to balance all of that out. How do I balance it all out? I simply balance it all out through prayer. So pray, have faith, be anointed, come to the church, be anointed when you're sick, take your medication, seek the will of the Lord. Chapter 39, it's entitled in my Bible, Hezekiah's Sin. Hezekiah's Failure, I think, might be a better term for it, because it, it is sin, without a doubt. Now, I don't really know when this happened. It says starts out saying, at that time, but chapter 38 started out, and so, uh, in those days. So I don't know exactly when it was. I really believe that it was after he was delivered from death, and I believe it was after he was delivered from Assyria, because it just seems to make a little bit more sense to me I looked up what the uh, commentators have to say. Some say it happened before Assyria. Some say it happened after Assyria. So in other words, nobody really knows because the Bible doesn't say so. But nonetheless, I believe that it takes place after God's deliverance from that which will take his life and that which has threatened his life. But unfortunately, what we have here is, is a picture of pride. A picture of pride in this man who God has done so much. It doesn't make him an exceptionally bad man because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Matter of fact, even in this situation, we need to see ourselves here. There was this, the time of Medorak, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, in verse 1, he sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of the treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointments, and all of his armory, and all that was found amongst the treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his uh, dominion that Hezekiah did not show him. In Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, it gives a parallel account of what is going on here, and it really shows us what is going on here. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Second uh, Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. Why? In order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. And right away, Hezekiah, just like King Nebuchadnezzar will later on, was impressed with what he has done. I'm alive, and these people are now coming to see me, as if he's the one who spared his own life. Look, Assyria came into the land, and I still got all of my, I got my head, and I got all of my treasure. Who else can say something like that? Didn't seem to be bragging on what the Lord was doing here. Matter of fact, it just fits together, if we know the Bible from front to back, that he was more than likely bragging upon what he has done. Who likes to sit and listen to somebody's boasting in themselves? I mean, do you, would you enjoy going over to an acquaintance's house and listen to somebody boast about their home, their kids, and you know, just everything that's going on? 
more than likely not. Well, just think how God enjoys something like that, especially when it's he who worked the deliverance. So we see the situation, and then there's an interrogation, verses 3 through 4. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come uh, from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, they came to me from a far country from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing amongst my treasures that I have not shown them. I would imagine that was probably not sang out in a boastful tone. I, I showed him everything. I would imagine he's kind because remember, what's Hezekiah? I'm sorry, what's Isaiah? Isaiah is the prophet. Isaiah is the word of God. And in the word of God, if this is truly sin, there's going to be conviction. And if there's conviction, he's not boasting before the Lord. See, the problem was with, with Isaiah, it's, as him being excluded from the equation here, he could have given God's will and God's advice, but Hezekiah cut Isaiah out of it. And as the prophet is cut out, the word of God was cut out. The advice of God, the desire of God was cut out. And now it's only entering into the picture. He only has an ear to hear after the fact. And what did he do? Isaiah the prophet went to the king Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and from where did they come? Now, when there's a question asked by the Lord, and again, this is a prophet asking through the uh, God asking through the prophet, when the question is asked, it's not that God doesn't know the answer. It's that God wants you to know the answer. He wants you to go on record for what you have done and what you have done wrong. What did he say to Adam? Adam, where are you? It's not like God saying, Michael, have you seen Adam? I can't find Adam anywhere. He knew where Adam was. He was hiding in the bushes with fig leaves pasted all over him like an idiot. Adam, where are you? I'm over here with a bunch of fig leaves pasted all over me. And, you know, but the idea was is for Adam to consider where he is at. I used to walk with the Lord in the coolness of the day, and now I'm hiding in bushes. Something's wrong with that. Hezekiah, what'd you do? No, I, I, I told them, or I showed them everything that I had. I kind of built myself up. And as I've done so, a bad thing. Situation, interrogation, and then a proclamation, verses 5 through 7. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You know the quote, because most people misquote it, in Proverbs chapter 16, verses 18 through 19, and I think it's a little bit broader in Hezekiah's situation that not necessarily happening in his lifetime, but in the lifetimes of his son, but pride goes before the fall. No, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Better to be a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Well, he's become a little prideful. He's become a little prideful. It's the danger that we enter in after God has done an amazing thing in our lives. We can start thinking that we're somebody. See, in the trial, you could have been like Hezekiah. Turned your face to the wall. Sought him in diligent prayer with tears in your eyes. Then all of a sudden you've been delivered and you're looking at the riches and you're looking at what you've done or whatever the situation might be. But the fact of the matter is you're not quite seeking him out as seriously as you did before. And it's a very dangerous place to be in. Verse 8. Verse 8 is kind of pitiful. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. He goes, yeah, it's the right thing. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. Well, a lot of good that's going to do your great-grandchildren and everybody else. And, you know, I can look at that and say, you know, what a ridiculous thing to say, but how have we affected our future generations by the sins that we have committed throughout our lifetime as well? Once again, it's all about the grace of God. Second Chronicles 32, verse 26 says, Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Lord, your will be done. Now God knew the hearts of his descendants and all of that, but he also let Hezekiah know you opened a very bad door here. You opened a door. And again, your, your testimony your testimony has is, is been so good and, and so right, but then there's going to be this black spot. We all have the black spot. We all have the black spot. We thank God for his grace. We thank God for his grace that not only set us free, but his grace that continues to keep us and the grace that continues to move us forward. We're far from perfect people. We ought not to present ourselves as such. We ought to give grace as grace has been given to ourselves so that each and every one of us, we in the congregation of God can praise him together and we can enjoy the fellowship that God has given us. Father, we just once again just thank you for your word that has blessed us and continues to keep us. Father, even as your word was a conviction to Hezekiah, I pray that your word would be a conviction to us. I pray, Father, that we would see the areas of life that we have become prideful. I pray, Father, that we would know and understand that we have been delivered from death. But, Father, we have also been to, delivered from that which would threaten us, that those trials, Lord, that can so easily paralyze us, those trials that can so easily knock us off our feet. So, Father, I just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would bless us, that, Father, we would truly number our days. Lord, we would learn to put the past in the past. And even, Father, our future failures, those times when maybe pride enters into our life, but, Father, we will continue to move boldly in the face of opposition, understanding, Lord, that if you are for us, then there's nothing that can come up against us. Lord, we just look forward to December 14th and all of the other days that you have set before us, Lord. We thank you that you have numbered our days and that these things are under your control as you are sovereign Lord over every aspect of our lives. We just give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You all stand, please.